Galatians chapter 6. After a marathon session last week, I'm still catching my breath for making it through nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And um, not sure we got as much in the last part as we did the first, but hopefully you got a good, a good um, bit of what the fruit of the Spirit is all about. Just think about who Jesus is. And the more you become like Him, well, that's the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what He wants for us. That's the vision He puts out for us. That we can be like Him. That we can be loving, joyful, peaceful, kind, gentle, self-controlled, good. What am I missing? Faithful people. Maybe one I missed there. Patience. Patience. Oh, I forgot patience. How could I forget patience? See, that's what I was doing last week with you. I was teaching you patience. And, uh, so I'm going to try not to do that part as much today. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves. Or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. So carry each other's burdens. I wish you could have all known my grandpa, Grandpa Severson. Grandpa Severson was a very interesting person. Um, and growing up with Grandpa Severson, there was a number of things. In the community, he was known as a farmer, a big farmer, because in the days when people had 80 acres or 160, he had over 1,000. He had all kinds of people work for him. He had a big operation. He's also known kind of playing with the mercantile, the grain futures and that sort of thing. He was pretty good at it, made pretty good money at it. He was also, interestingly, a politician. He was a local politician mostly. He was best known as a county commissioner. For years and years, he was the one in charge of getting the roads in shape and making sure that the snow was all plowed. And in Minnesota, that's kind of an important thing. And he did a pretty good job of it. But one of his crowning achievement as a county commissioner was that he managed to talk three other counties into joining their county in building a park. A big, beautiful park right next to Walnut Grove, you know, the home of Laura Ingalls Wilder, where I grew up, that whole area. And this big, beautiful park, Plum Creek Park, um, with a man-made lake called Lake Laura, after Laura Ingalls Wilder, of course, um, became his kind of his crowning achievement of those years as county commissioner. And what he was trying to do, he told us grandchildren, when he built that park was, he said, I want to have a park that's for my grandchildren. And I want something in that park for every grandchild. And so there were some who liked to swim, so we got the lake. There were some who liked to go camping, so we had camping spots. There were some who liked to play sports, so we had all kinds of you know, softball and baseball diamonds and different soccer fields and all kinds of things like that. And um, they had various things. And we all liked to eat, so we had lots of picnic shelters and picnic tables. But the thing that I really liked to do was go hiking. So we had hiking trails. And that was kind of the part that I had kind of insisted that we ought to have in the park. And part of that, too, was that the other thing to us grandchildren that he was known for was two things. Skunk stories. I should put my picture up here. Skunk stories and skunk hunting. Um, he was kind of an imaginative, creative guy, and he loved to tell stories. And they were never the same. They had some of the same characters. But every time he told a story, it was always about skunks. Families of skunks that were doing this or that or the other thing. And sometimes 
they resembled us grandchildren. Right? But he always told these stories, and we loved them, these, these skunk stories. And then, after we get done with the skunk stories, he'd take us grandchildren up to the park. And guess what we would do? We'd go skunk hunting. Skunk hunting, of course. We, he never expected to find a skunk. Never believe what happened one time. We were having a great time, and we were out there skunk hunting, looking everywhere for skunks, you know. And we spotted one. <laughs> Grandpa, there's a skunk right there! And so a couple of us started running toward it. He's no, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't go, no, don't scare him off, you know. And eventually he said, well, you know, we forgot our gummy sack. And we forgot, you know, we forgot a few things. So maybe we'll just leave him today and we'll come back another time. There were always these beautiful adventures that were part of it. Skunk hunting. Because I think why I learned to like to hike. That's why I like to go in the woods and, and just enjoy the beauty of nature. But the other side of the story, and it really doesn't have anything to do with my grandpa, but is that although I like to hike, there's one thing that happens to me a lot when I go hiking. And guess what it is? I got weak ankles. And I've been known a time or two, a year or a month sometimes, to be out there on the trail and hit a root or a rock or an uneven piece of ground. And guess what happens? I'm flat on the ground. <laughs> it happens to me all the time. Well, who can attest to this? It's like almost every time we go out. Last night we went hiking and it didn't happen to me. So I can say that it doesn't happen every time. But there is this tendency to, you know, have this sudden experience when I'm not expecting and I end up flat on my face. Now, we've been talking about walking in the Spirit. Keeping in step with the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit. Having the fruit of the Spirit. But it's interesting how many of the terms have to do with walking, keeping in step, being led. It's like we're going down a pathway. It's a relationship where we're walking hand in hand with the Holy Spirit. T together we're doing ministry. We're walking. And He's helping us and He's producing the fruit of the Spirit within us. But guess what? Just like every other trail that I go down, there are days when I hit that unexpected route and I find myself flat on my face. And I bet it happens to you too, if not literally, metaphorically speaking. It happens to us. Sometimes we're walking along and we're doing good and then just suddenly we run into something and we fall flat on our face. It happens a lot. Paul has some, he has some things to tell us about um, Restoring those who fall in their walk with the Lord. And he has some interesting things to tell us. One of the things I want you to notice about this little, I always like to give you a little bit of a word study, in the, the, the words that talk about being caught in a sin, this is a, this is a word that means to be overtaken by surprise. To be overpowered before one could escape. So when you fall into sin here, like this person, this person that you know, is walking with the Lord, but then all of a sudden they, they suddenly were overtaken by something. Kind of like you're walking along and you just hit that crazy root and you find yourself on the ground. You're suddenly overtaken by a sin and you find yourself falling. That's what we're talking about here. And the word for sin here is the word for have, making a false step. I mean, that's the, literally what it means in the Greek, is to, to make a false step. I mean, it's like, oh, it's like falling, right? <laughs> there I do. There I went. No, I, I had to do that just to get some of you awake this morning. <laughs> you see, it's a false step. When you, you're, you're, you're walking out there, you're doing pretty good, and then all of a sudden, something comes upon you, and you're not expecting it, and all of a sudden, you're flat on your face. Um, Guthrie in his commentary says the results of stepping aside may have been chosen because of its appropriateness to the Christian life as a walk by the Spirit. We're walking along, we're doing pretty good, and then all of a sudden, oh, I'm on the ground. Somebody restore me. Yep. Somebody, could somebody come alongside, please, and lift me up? Would somebody come alongside and mend this 
wounded ankle of mine, would somebody come alongside and put me back on the track and help me take a few steps in the right direction? That's what we're talking about here. Restoring someone who has fallen. They were doing pretty good, but then they fell into sin. What do we do about that? And so there's two things in particular I want us to focus in on. One is that we have to carry our own load, and then we have to carry each other's burdens. I think it's fascinating that he puts those two things up there. Carry your own load, and carry each other's burdens. It's both. Both of them are commands to us, and restore each other gently when we do fall down. Three things we need to do, and since I want to confuse you, I'm going to start with the last one first, and that's each one should carry their own load. Now, in Myanmar here, uh, you can see that when they're carrying a load, it's a pretty major load sometimes. Um, baskets all over the place. And you have to, you know, there are times where it seems like the loads are just too much, right? And, and it's true. That's why we're supposed to carry each other's load. But Paul, I think, First of all, he's going to tell us that we need to carry our own loads. Now, what in the world does that mean? How do we do that? He says it in a couple ways. In verse 1, he says, You who are living by the Spirit. And that's his expectation. That's not about some super saints out there. Well, there's a couple of you who are living by the Spirit. But it's his expectation for all of us. That we're ones who are the pneumatikos people. We're the ones living by the Spirit. And then in verse 5, he specifically says, each one should carry their own load. Now, I, let's see, I don't think Joe is here today, but you know, my old, she used to work on an airplane. Um, you go on an airplane ride and you hear this announcement, you know, this, she comes up, should the cabin experience sudden pressure loss, stay calm and listen for instructions from the cabin. <coughs> Oxygen mask will drop down from above your seat, place the mask over your mouth and nose, Pull the strap to tighten it. If you're traveling with children, make sure that your, your own mask is on first before helping your children. I was thinking about that in this, in this case. You see, before we can be very good at bearing each other's burdens, we got to make sure that our mask is on tight. we got to make sure that we're getting the oxygen that we need before we can really help the people who are next to us. And when it comes to your walk with God, you are primarily responsible to be filled with the Spirit, to be walking with the Spirit, to be keeping in step with the Spirit, and to be led by the Spirit. Nobody else can do that for you. You have to make the choice. You have to be intentional to make sure that the garden of your soul is well tilled, that the, that the weeds are pulled, that the rocks are taken out, so that you've got good soil, that the fruit of the Spirit can be born and produced in you. So you got to put your own mask on first. You have to carry your own load. You first and foremost are primarily responsible for the garden of your soul, for your own spiritual growth. I can't do it for you. You say, Pastor, I don't feel like I'm very loving. I'm not very joyful. I don't have much peace. I don't have self-control. I'm not going to zap you. You know, which is not going to happen that way. Yeah, I'm not planning to anyway. But, but what is going to happen is that you have to be intentional about your own walk with the Lord. If you aren't spending time in the Word, how are you going to grow? If you aren't praying, how are you going to have a relationship with God? If you're not in fellowship with other believers, how are they going to help you bear the burdens how are you going to experience the growth that you need to experience? If you're not showing up for church on Sunday, well, you're missing out, people. You're primarily responsible for the garden of your soul, for your own spiritual growth. You must be intentional so you don't drift, that you don't fall, that you don't get off the path. You must live in the Spirit so that the fruit is produced in you. And you have to be intentional about that. Hebrews talks about how easy it is to drift and how true it is. I remember as a kid growing up, we had our lake cabin that wasn't too far away. We'd go out to the lake all the time. We'd get on inner tubes and we'd, we'd be on the top of those things and we would just sit there. We'd be playing along. And after a while, you kind of drift off into sleep 
And you, it was amazing. The currents would start to take you further and further from the beach, further and further from your dock where you know, your cabin was. And if you weren't careful of it, I knew people who got caught up in a current and they lost, they were lost completely. We never figured out what happened to them. Um, it occasionally happens. You don't want to drift in your walk with God. Carry your own load, people. Make sure you have times of prayer. Make sure that you have the disciplines that you need in order that you're growing in your faith. You don't want to drift. You don't want to get too busy with work. You don't want to get too busy with school. You don't want to get too busy with your toys. You don't want to get so busy with people that you don't have time for the Lord. You, you, we all need margin in our life in order to stay strong. We all need time spent with the Lord. And if we're too busy, well, we're going to be too busy for Him. And we're not going to grow like we could. So carry your own load. Verse 1, he says, You who live by the Spirit. He said, this is God's vision for you. He said, live by the Spirit. I'm having enough trouble just kind of getting along from day to day. Well, that's probably the problem then. <laughs> the Spirit of God is there to lead you and guide you, to produce the character of Christ within you, to empower you to obey what Christ has commanded you to do. It's there. The Spirit is there. He is your companion along the way, your helper, your comforter, your encourager. He's, a He's there to help you do this thing. Are you paying attention? Are you listening? Have you surrendered yourself so that He can control you? Is He empowering you? Do you carry your own load. Now, He's going to be the one who pushes you forward. But you have to be intentional. You have to make the choice to be a living sacrifice. You need to be born of the Spirit. If you've not been born again, well, then you don't have the Spirit. <laughs> So you need to be born of the Spirit. You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to be walking. You need to be keeping in step. And you, you know when you're trying to keep it. When I was a kid and I was in band, the most interesting part of the band year was summer because we did parades and field shows in the fall for football games. And guess what we had to learn how to do? Keep in step. Not my thing. Okay. Keep it in step. You know, it's hard. You're playing an instrument, you're trying to pay attention to what you're supposed to be playing, and then you're marching and trying to stay in a straight line or make designs out on the football field. It's a crazy thing. You really have to pay attention if you're going to keep in step. Most people aren't very good at it. You go to a parade with a band in it, and you'll see there's not very many bands that are good at keeping in step. And we're not very good at it either, are we? And not really. We need to be keeping in step. You don't want to miss out when the Spirit's leading you and telling you to do something. You don't want to say, oh, too fast. I'm going to slow this thing down. You know, I, Spirit, I know that's what you want me to do, but you know, we'll get around to it someday. You know, we'll put this off for another day. Or when he's saying, no, don't do that. And you feel the nudge of the Spirit, the conviction of the Spirit. And you get that sometimes, right? It's not just me, right? <laughs> Hopefully it's not just me. There's times where you get that Oh, shouldn't be doing that one. And you resist it. What happens? There's the potential, if you keep at that for long enough, you get a seared conscience. You don't want that. You don't want that. You become desensitized to the voice of the Spirit. You don't want that. You need to, you need to, have, you need to walk with Him and keep in step with Him. Be led by Him. So, you who live by the Spirit... That's what God intends for you. You say, well, Pastor Joe, I know you just got through chapter 5, and we talked about all these things, and phew, I got through that one. Now I can move on to something. No. If you haven't gotten it yet, you need to get this. This is the whole key to the book. The whole key to this Galatians thing is that you have to find the freedom that comes by the power of the Spirit. And it only comes as we surrender ourselves to Him, and He empowers us. To live for Christ. If you don't do that, how are you going to be walking in step with the Spirit? You're just not going to be doing it. So, the first thing, then after he says that, he says, watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. So don't be overconfident. You're thinking, oh, you know, I've been making good progress. I'm out now walking three, four miles, these big, nice hikes, and 
And just as you get about halfway away at the farthest point, that's when you're going to hit the stick. That's when you're going to hit the root and like, boom, you're back on the floor again. When you get overconfident, that's when you're most tempted to fall. You're most, when you're not paying attention, you just kind of feel, oh, I got this thing down, we're doing good, we're being led by the Spirit. I, and then all of a sudden I'm flat on my face again. So don't be overconfident. You, you have three, three um, forces against you. You've got the world, you've got the flesh, and you've got the devil. And they're all wanting you to hit the ground. They're all wanting you to fall. They're all trying to say, you know what? See, this, see the fork in the road? The spirit says go this way. But the flesh is saying, oh, this looks so much better. Let's try this path over here. And then you've got the devil saying, oh, yeah. Doesn't that look good? And then, what else have you got? You've got some other friends around you who are saying, you know what? I'm going to take that path. Why don't you come with me? Sometimes the people you associate with you get, in, get you in trouble. Try to fit in. A little peer pressure thing again. So, so what do you need to do? Stand firm, people. Put on the armor of God. Stand firm. Stand firm against all the wiles of the enemy. And he's pretty good. He's pretty smart. He's, he knows your weaknesses. And he will work at it. So carry your own. Don't get overconfident. You could be tempted too. Sometimes it's the temptation of pride when you're restoring someone who's fallen. And you yourself have gotten proud. That's a, you're going to fall. Sometimes it's that you are influenced to follow the person into the stumbling. In any case, it's not a good place to be. One of my favorite parables is the parable of the sower. You find it in all the Gospels. But in Mark, I was just looking at the Mark one. I read the Matthew one not that long ago. It's an interesting, you, you know the story, right? You remember the parable? You got a farmer, and he's, he's sowing seed. And there's different, and the seed falls onto different kinds of ground. You got some that falls on the path. You got some that falls in the rocky soil. And you got some that falls in the soil that is filled with thorns or thistles or something. And then you got the good soil. Well, think about it. And then Jesus goes on to explain it. And he says that the, the seed, the word of God, as it, as it falls on the path and the bird picks it up, who's the bird? Well, Jesus said that's the evil one. That's Satan. He's looking for that seed before it can sprout. He's looking to grab that word before it is able to even sprout in your life. You think about that. How many times have you let the Word of God, Satan grabbed it before you even spent time listening to what God wanted to say today? Satan's pretty good. Oh, you're too busy today. you got these things you've got to do today. You don't have time for the Word today. Evil one snatches the Word. Can't take root in our lives. Then there's a rocky ground. All kinds of people get disappointed with God. They think, oh, I'm going through troubles. I'm going through trials, suffering, persecution. And he says, that's like the rocky soil. The, the, the seed goes kind of into the rock. You've been to Lake Alpine, you know. They've got trees growing out of these great big rocks. You wonder, how can that happen? And it happens. You know, even in the rocky soil, it'll sprout up. But it really doesn't grow very well when it's in the rocky soil. When I was a kid, one of the jobs I hated was having to go out every year and take the rocks out of the field. And we'd go up and down the field with the tractor, and, and we'd walk alongside, and we'd throw the rocks onto the, onto the hay. Well, we basically use a hay wagon for it, but different people use different kinds of wagons. And I hated that job, but you had to do it, because the rocks will choke out the seed. And the troubles and, and the difficulties of life will sometimes make you disappointed. And you will lose, you will lose track of your bearings, and you can lose your faith in the midst of it. I've seen people, all kinds of people, that life had gotten tough, and they gave up. They said, "That's enough of that, God. I don't know what you're doing. I don't get it, and you don't seem very good right now. I'm disappointed with you." Or sometimes it's not the trials; it's the people of God. Sometimes it's the people that disappoint us. Sometimes it's the church that lets us down. 
It, there's a lot of different ways it happens. But people get disappointed with God. It's rocky ground. You don't want to go there. Get, get the rocks out. Then there's the thorns. There's sometimes life is good. Too good. All the good things, all the blessings of God become idols. Or they become burdens. I can't sleep at night. What if somebody takes this? What if somebody does that? Maybe the stock market will fall. You know, Maybe I'll lose my job. We start to worry about this anxiety and worry along with making those toys our idols. These are things that can get us distracted from the Word of God taking root in our lives. We, we drift off in the garden of our soul. It just doesn't look like it should. It's not producing good fruit. It's got thorns and rocks, and it looks like nobody's touched that thing all year. You ever have a garden like that? I know some people who garden that way. You know, they put it into the ground and then they leave it. And it's like, they can't find, where'd those carrots go? I am not sure where, I know they're here someplace. And where are those tomatoes? Oh, by the way, some of you were led by the Spirit this week. We got a couple of tomatoes, so I was thankful for that. Garden of your soul, the good soil, produces 30, 60, even 100 times what's sown in your life. The fruit of the Spirit, fruitful ministry. God wants you to be fruitful, but you got to tend the soil of your heart. And you must carry your own load. Do you get it? That's where it starts. Get your own mask on. Check your attitude. Make sure it's an attitude of humility. If anyone thinks they're something when they're not, they deceive themselves. There's a lot of deception out there today, people. A lot of people who think they're something. They think they're something. But they're nothing. Humble yourself. And especially if you're going to be used to bear others' burdens and restore people gently, you've got to do it from a place of humility. It's not going to happen. If you come at it with pride. Oh, I'm so much more spiritual. I'm among the spiritual, and I've come here to restore you gently. <laughs> into the, you don't know how that's going to go. So, you know, there, carry your own load. Get your attitude right. Test your actions and your obedience. Each one should test their own actions. Verse 4. Each one should test their own actions. And they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. You've got to test yourself. How are you doing? Am I living out the Word of God? Examine yourself. Am I doing it? You see, here's how it goes. John 15. We abide in Him. We abide in Him. We spend time with the Lord. And out of that intimacy with God, then what happens? Obedience. There's other things too. Joy and answered prayer and all kinds of good things. And then what does that lead to? Fruitfulness. You go back and read it for yourself. John 15. Beautiful chapter. But it talks about fruitfulness. And it says that you have to be connected to the vine. And that's Jesus. You've got to spend time abiding in His love and abiding in His presence and abiding in His Word. And if you're going to grow, if you're going to be fruitful, if you're going to have your prayers answered, if you're going to walk in obedience, you've got to be connected. And you've got to be connected on a ring. You know, vines don't, do, if you're a branch like we are, you don't just say, okay, well, one day a week I'm going to get connected. You know, okay, on Sunday I'm going to connect. All right. Well, maybe not this week, but some week I'll get back to connecting to the vine. Doesn't work, does it? It's got to be daily. It's got to be something continuous. We're walking with God. We're Tending the garden of our soul. So carry your own load, people. How are you doing? How are you doing? Well, the good news is that's not the whole story. We also carry each other's burdens. And the beautiful thing about the body of Christ is that we're here for each other. God intended for us to be here for one another. In fact, there are all kinds of one another's in Scripture. The each other's and the one another's. Um, all the ways that we pray for each other and we, we encourage one another and we, you know, we love one another and we bear with each other, we forgive one another. There's all these one another's of Scripture because we need each other. And Paul recognizes that. He says, you know what? Yes, you have to bear your own burden. You take responsibility for your own walk with God. But you also need help. 
You can't do it by yourself. No lone ranger, Christians. It just doesn't work. Carry each other's burden, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. So if the essence of the, the law is to love God with all your heart and all your soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, how do you fulfill the law of Christ? By the one another's. By bearing with each other, by loving each other, by praying for each other, by encouraging each other, by bearing each other's burdens. And you know what? Each of us has burdens. <laughs> well, each of us are primarily responsible for our own walk with God. We must carry our own load. We still need each other. We're commanded to carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ to love God and to love our neighbor. Financial burdens. Some of us, some of us go through some pretty tough times. Lose a job. You know, just struggle to make ends meet. There's relationships. They sometimes go sour. They, it's an amazing thing. But, you know, despite the fruit of the Spirit, we don't always get along like we should. Right? And we need people to come around us and to help us. Iron sharpens iron. We need that help sometimes. Physical burdens. Some of you guys have horrible physical pain or, or physical ailments or suffering that you're going through. I was talking to Wanda the other day. I started at the post office. And she's just hurting so bad from this last back surgery. She said, I feel worse than when I got the last surgery now. And as these things happen. And we need each other. Um, burdens at work, school. You know, there's all kinds of burdens. We all have them. And we need each other. And then the burden of falling down. Of being need to, to be restored gently. I've, gotten, I've drifted off. I've gone I'm on my own. I need someone to come alongside me. That's why we need fellowship. So we don't fall. Carry each other's burdens. How are we going to do that? Let me suggest to you a three-part plan. First of all, pray for each other. James 5 tells us that the church is a healing community. It's a place where we confess our sins and we pray for each other and we sing songs of praise. It's a place where we come together and we help each other. And we carry each other's burdens. And then we need to encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians, Hebrews 3, other texts we can look at. And then we need to restore gently, which is what he tells us in this text. Um, you see, God really does hear and answer prayers. I heard somebody preaching this week that said, God is not a great cosmic unblinking stare. Let me think about that one for a minute. There's some people get this idea that God just kind of sits up there in heaven and watches. And that's all he does. Got it all figured out. Everything's in place. We had the deists, that was a very common thing. But there's a lot of us who were, grew up in Bible-believing churches that don't think God's doing a thing. They're not sure that their prayers ever get to the ceiling and that God ever listens or changes things. No, He does. He calls us to an interactive relationship with Him, and He does work through our prayers. Know it. He's not just up there staring at us. No, he's interacting with us. And part of that is prayer. I'm so excited about Wednesday night because, you know, we fill this part right here with people praying. Right. It's been, you know, 20, 30 people, I think, showing up on Wednesday nights. And I'm just stoked about that because that, the, the one thing the Lord told me when I first came here is get the fire burning in prayer. And everything else will start to, to fall into place. And it's starting to burn a little bit on, on Wednesday nights. I, I praise God for that. And it's not, it's everybody from people in their 80s down to people that are less than 8. I don't know, what, what's Julie now? 6, 7? 6. 6 to 80 something. 85, almost 86. It's great. Multi generational praying. And often the younger ones, they pray these beautiful prayers that are so filled with faith. Right. And I love that. Um, so let's pray for each other. And let's really encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you're doing. Hebrews 3.13 But encourage one another daily 
as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See, sin is deceitful. It sneaks up on us, and we fall down. Don't give in to it. We need to encourage each other. I thank God for Ray of Sunshine. They bring out those cheer bags, and they, and they encourage people with cards. Oh, there ought to be more of that going on in the body of Christ. We need to encourage each other. And guess what? This is today. So that means you should encourage somebody today. And you notice what he says there? Encourage someone as long as it's called today. This isn't tomorrow, and it's not yesterday. This is today. So guess what? You get to encourage someone today. You don't have to wait till tomorrow, and you don't have to, oh, I missed yesterday. No, today is the day to encourage people. You get it? Yep. Oh, my. So there you go. Restore each other gently. In a surgical context, it means to mend the bone. This word to restore. It's like a doctor does. You come in with a broken bone, and what does he do? He restores it gently. He mends it. Fishermen use the same word to describe when they fix their nets. They would mend the nets and get them ready for fishing again. And when we sin, when we fall, we need to be mended. We need someone to come alongside us gently and say, Oh, let me fix that. Let me set that bone. Let me give you the cast. Let me lift you up and help you. We all need... Like the story of the Good Samaritan, people to come alongside of us and restore us gently. And gently is the same basic word that we saw in 523. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a part of the fruit of the Spirit. Restoring something. He said, so if you're living by the Spirit and you have His gentleness, guess what you can do? In that same gentleness of the fruit of the Spirit, you look for people who need help. You look for brothers and sisters that are drifting right now. You look for brothers and sisters that are falling right now. For some who have taken some false steps. And you do what you can to restore them gently. Don't look down your nose at them. Don't do it with pride. But gently, gently, with humility, restore them. Try to help them. I just want to ask you the question this morning. Who do you know? Who's fallen? Who do you know who's been straying? Who do you know who's been drifting? Who do you know who's just plain lost? You know any prodigals? They got started well, but man, they just kind of gone their own direction. What about those lone rangers? Those people say, I don't need the church, I don't need other believers. Those disconnected believers who are out there all by themselves, don't have a clue how much they need others in the body of Christ. Can I just, can we get serious about this text? Yeah. Can we get serious? About, because we need to. We live in a day where people think the church doesn't matter, and then my lackadaisical attitude toward church attendance, and, and my lackadaisical attitude toward spending time with God in the Word and in prayer, and that's not a big deal. That I can go waste all my time doing these things, but I don't have time for the Lord. Can we get serious about changing that? Can we get serious about, first of all, carrying our own burden, but then helping each other carry their burdens and restoring other people gently? Can I just suggest how we might do that? Why don't you make a list of people that you know? Make a list of people, lost, drifting, you know, disconnected, people that you know that are hurting and suffering and they're not, maybe their church attendance isn't good, maybe they're, you just know there's something in their life that's not right. Get them on a prayer list. Write their names down and start praying for them daily because God will hear those prayers. It is His will that we live by the Spirit and not that we fall down. You get that? So we can pray with confidence for these people. Let's make a list, everybody. Let's make a list of people you know, prodigals, lost, hurting, disconnected people. And maybe you want to share your list with a small group that you pray with, or maybe you want to share it with me, because I'll pray with you. Or if you want, we could have our Wednesday night group pray with you. 
But let's collect these people and let's pray specifically for them, for God to work in their lives and draw them to Jesus. And then maybe you could send an encouraging note or an email or have a little phone call or get together for coffee and just fellowship with them. Look for the opportunity to restore the person gently. Now, don't be overbearing and don't be weird about it, okay? Because you can, you can make it go the other direction if you're weird about it. And, and make it, well, boy, we haven't seen you at church for a long time. <laughs> that's not going to work, right? You know, that's just not going to work. But, you know, I really missed you. Could we get together and have some fellowship and some coffee, you know? Just let them know you, you, you love those people. You want, you miss them. You want to spend time with them. And then in that process, who knows where the Lord will take that conversation. But you don't come across as judgmental, it won't work. But come across as loving and gentle. Could you do that? Make a list. Start praying. Get some other people to pray with you. I would love to pray with you for some of those people. We have some people on Wednesday night that would love to pray specifically for you. And for the friends that you know who need a deeper connection with Jesus. And there's one last thing I want to say is this. We carry our own as far as our responsibility is concerned to walk with God. We carry each other's burdens because we're there to help each other. And we all go through tough times and we need somebody to take our hand and help us up. We all need that. But there's another thing, and that is that we can take all of our burdens to the Lord. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Whatever burden you got this morning, we're here for each other, to pray for each other, to help each other to lift each other up, to encourage each other. But the most important thing we can do is we can bear you up before the Lord. And we can take our burdens and bring them to Him because He longs to walk beside us and to help us along the way. And when He's running the show, when Jesus is running the show and teaching us how to do it, there's rest for your soul. There's rest. Well-ordered garden of the soul. Because Jesus is running the show. But we're going to sing a song about taking our burdens and leaving them there. Why don't you stand and we'll sing together.